Howdy. Today we're going to continue talking about point defects uh, and we're going to work through some definitions and a lot of these you may have seen in your intro materials class before but we uh, want to touch on them again um, and that's going to lead into a notation that we use to describe point defects in systems and that's co-gripping notation. Um, so first we're going to talk about intrinsic defects and that means uh, defects that occur that are not related to chemical impurities basically. Um, so uh, if I have a system, you know, this could be any li lattice, it could be iron, it could be silicon, it could be carbon, um, uh, then we could have two potential things happen. We could have vacancies, and again, a vacancy is a missing atom on a lattice uh, where we expect there to be an atom. Uh, or we could have interstitials, and when that interstitial is the same kind of atom uh, as occurs uh, elsewhere in the material, then we call that a self-interstitial. So for example, um, an iron atom uh, in an iron lattice that is uh, sitting in one of these interstitial positions that would be called a self-interstitial. Um, and it's important to understand that, that these defects affect the surrounding volume as well. So there's a distortion immediately around uh, volume, um, you know, because uh, there's essentially there's a vacuum here. Um, and so these atoms are sort of drawn into it. Um, and because there's an extra atom in the lattice, and that's, that's pushing the atomic planes outwards. Um, so if you think about um, that being a localized region of compression or expansion, um, then we can, we, can think about, uh, we can think about it in terms of there being either tension or compression around an area. So if we have a vacancy, there's a missing atom, the other atoms tend to get drawn in and so that system uh, is locally in tension. Um, and so one way I think about it is if there's a missing atom here again, the other atoms are sort of being pulled into that vacant spot and that pulling is the tension. They're being, the bonds are being stretched between um, you know, neighboring atoms and the other atoms that they would be locally bound to. Um, similarly, when we have an interstitial uh, atom, uh, the local region around interstitials is in compression. Um, and that is just because this atom is um, occupying some volume. Usually there's nothing there. So it's pushing the surrounding atoms outwards a little bit. Um, and uh, and that, uh, that is a compressive force. Um, so in, around interstitials, we have a little bit of compression. And, th and this is important for understanding how um, different point defects interact, particularly with dislocations, which can also have uh, regions of t tension and compression around them. Um, so interstitials, you know, this is where we, we look at a lattice and we look at, um, you know, there being a bunch of coordination geometries in the lattice. Um, and so the spots in the middle of those coordination geometries um, are, are the interstitial locations. Um, and the kind of interstitial it is, is def defined by that number of surrounding atoms. So this pinkish one up here, where I'm putting the X, that's an example of an octahedral interstitial site because it's surrounded by an octahedron. These four atoms on the equator, one on the North Pole, uh, one on the South Pole. Um, so six atoms, eight faces, that's an octahedron. This blue shape right here, the middle is right about there. It's you know hard to perceive depth in my 3D drawing, um, but this is a tetrahedron. Uh, and the, the sort of site that's located in the middle of that tetrahedron would be a tetrahedral interstitial site. Um, and so examples of those are also um, drawn over here as well. Uh, so where do intrinsic defects come from? Um, and because we kind of think about, um, you know, in many cases we just draw a picture and there's a, there's a hole there or there's, a, there's a, um, an extra atom. Um, and one way they can come from is they can sort of spontaneously, um, you know, a, an atom from an, a lattice site can be knocked off its lattice site and can be moved to an interstitial site. Um, and so this, uh, it, when this en atom here has enough energy to get kicked out and to move over to this interstitial um, uh, place, uh, then it leaves behind a vacancy. So we've created a vacancy um, and uh, we've also created an interstitial uh, at the same time. Um, and so one way that we can get intrinsic defects is spontaneously created within the middle of a lattice. Um, 
we can also, and I think we'll see this in a couple of slides, we can also get defects that are generated at a grain boundary and can then sort of migrate within the lattice. And so it's possible that you have a different number uh, of vacancies and interstitials in a crystal because some of them could be uh, more favorable to either be generated or be recombined at the boundary of a, of a grain, the very edge. Um, and I think that's, I got ahead of myself a little bit in a real material does the concentration of vacancies have to equal the concentration of interstitials? And so we, we just gave an example where one vacancy is created for every one interstitial, um, and that can happen. But then remember, crystals have finite sizes, and these vacancies are not static. They tend to move around. Um, and so it's possible, for example, let's say I spontaneously create a vacancy in an interstitial. If that interstitial moves to the edge of the lattice, um, then it could make the, the lattice one atom bigger over there. Um, and that would basically have the uh, net effect of um, adding one vacancy, but not adding an interstitial because that interstitial has been removed from the system. So it's very possible to have different. In fact, it's generally the case that we have a different number of vacancies and interstitials in a system. Um, similarly, uh, we can create things at grain boundaries. Um, and so, you know, again, this is just a picture of a 2D lattice, but you see there has to be an edge. There has to be an edge to the grain somewhere. And so one of these atoms on the edge could be moved to an interstitial site and it could sort of migrate around, find its way through the lattice and end up over here. Um, and so the net effect in this case is that we've added one vacancy, but we have not added an interstitial. We've just made the, the crystal one atom smaller. Um, so vacancies and interstitials can either be created or destroyed um, independently at grain boundaries. And of course, because matter is never really destroyed, you know, they're, they're either, they're basically recombining, they're popping into the lattice at the edge, uh, or if it's a vacancy, it's removing one atom from the very edge. Now, so far we've talked about just simple cases, vacancies and interstitials. Um, however, in real systems, um, you know, we generally have many, many, many more than just one defect. And in a lot of cases, it's favorable for these defects actually to uh, interact. Um, and so we can potentially get cases uh, where we have, uh, you know, two different um, defects uh, that are interacting um, in, in, uh, in a lattice. Um, or you could also think about it in terms of, you know, one defect is actually sort of locally uh, distorting the area around it. Um, so for example, in this case, uh, we might have a, um, a, you know, a, a, a pure material over here. Um, and if we have an additional interstitial atom kind of sneak its way through, well, this atom on the center of the face uh, doesn't necessarily stay there. It, it would be um, uh, offset, so that atom would move down um, and so, you know, I don't know, do you call this one defect or two? I mean, usually we talk about it uh, as a, in terms of a defect cluster. I mean, there's one net extra atom, um, but uh, this atom is not sitting on a lattice site, and this atom is not sitting on what's a traditional lattice site, so the two are interacting uh, with the areas around it. Uh, similarly, if we have uh, an extra interstitial in iron, um, we can get these, uh, these 110 dumbbell type formations uh, and an, an, uh, an extra interstitial in a HCP lattice. So HCP zinc, for example, um, will create uh, this dumbbell shape. And the dumbbell just means that, you know, I put an extra one in here, but this other one has been displaced as well. So we have this relatively symmetric uh, feature. So those are intrinsic defects. We also need to think about extrinsic defects or impurities. Um, and so those extrinsic atoms, they either are sitting on the lattice sites, so they're substituting uh, for some other atom. So this is a substitutional defect. So an example would be, you know, maybe we're putting some copper atoms into a gold lattice. Um, uh, and so the lattice is conserved, but the kind of atom that's sitting there is different. Um, uh, and then we also have interstitial defects as well. So particularly small things, things like carbon, things like nitrogen, uh, things like boron, you know, these small atoms, things like hydrogen, um, these small atoms tend to occupy interstitial sites in a lot of cases. Um, 
So in addition, um, when we think about ceramic materials, so when we have more than one atomic species, and particularly in ionic compounds, um, we oftentimes get um, point defect pairs. And those point defect pairs are created in order to maintain charge balance. Uh, and so two of the most common are called a Frenkel defect. Um, and so an, uh, an example is shown over here. Uh, and so basically, uh, we've taken uh, an atom that was sitting here, and it's been displaced to an interstitial site. So a Frenkel defect is a combination of a vacancy and an interstitial. Um, so there's no net uh, mass loss or mass gain within this dashed line. The only thing that's happened is this, uh, in this case, a, a cation was kicked off its normal site uh, and, and plopped in the middle of an interstitial over here. Um, another kind of defect is a Schottky defect. And so again, a Schottky defect is a paired set of cation and anion vacancies. So it's two kinds of vacancies, uh, a cation vacancy and an anion vacancy. And so there is a net uh, mass loss in this case. They've been, uh, in this case, they're removed out of the system. Uh, the reason that we have both of these kind of defects is that they are charge conserved defects. So the charge doesn't change in the Frankel defect because uh, no cations or anions have been removed from the system. Uh, and in a Schottky defect, um, basically you're removing some positive and some negative charge. And so the net effect is that you're maintaining charge balance. Um, and so that's why we tend to see these kinds of defect pairs uh, very frequently in ceramics. Um, and again, uh, we can create these in different cases. This is a little video. Um, where we look at uh, defects that are generated by high energy ion impact. Um, and again, remember a Frankel defect, that's where we've knocked an atom off its lattice site and into an interstitial. Um, and so the, this is the interstitial and it came from somewhere over here and it's a little difficult to see but because uh, we're looking in down a 3D projection, but uh, there's a, a missing uh, lattice over there. Um, so again, charge balance has to be maintained in ionic materials. Uh, and in a lot of cases, there's more than one way to do this. Um, and so we could think about a sodium chloride lattice uh, as an example. So sodium cations are blue, chlorine anions are green. Um, sodium is plus one, chlorine is minus one, uh, and the anions are larger, so they're shown as larger. Um, and we say, well, what happens if we substitute uh, calcium uh, into this lattice? So calcium would go on a cation position. Uh, so calcium maybe could sit here. Um, and then one of two things could happen. One of those things is that we have another sodium uh, vacancy. Um, and the reason that this happens, again, is we're maintaining charge balance. We're putting in a 2 plus, so we need to remove two 1 plus cations. Um, alternatively, you could, you could potentially think about a case where we're getting an interstitial anion uh, to balance that out, but interstitial anions are quite unlikely because interstitial anions, you know, anions in general tend to be relatively large, and so they have a large effect on the immediately surrounding lattice. Um, similarly, if I put oxygen in for the chlorine, chlorine anions, I could do the same thing. Oxygen is 2 minus, so I could remove uh, two chlorines. I could leave behind a chlorine vacancy, or... I could uh, put that oxygen in for one chlorine, and that could balance out the system with an additional sodium plus, um, so an interstitial sodium. Either of those would maintain charge balance, and interstitial sodium, uh, you know, sodium is relatively small, so it's, it's easy to squeeze in there. Um, so in any of these cases, you know, again, this is a case where we would calculate the energy of these two different kind of e defects, and we would potentially be able to say which one is more likely, um, and then we could focus on those in the system. Uh, so we're going to wrap up uh, here. Uh, the next video is going to talk about kroger vink notation, uh, which is a notation we use to, um, to write and express defects.